Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Luis Baez, who is in probably an equally sunny Sacramento. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me, John. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Luis is a revenue enablement strategist and sales coach dedicated to serving executives and sales leaders. In 2017, after years of working for some of the biggest Silicon Valley startups, think LinkedIn, Google, Uber, Tesla, and more. And it's a pretty impressive list. You're, you're obviously good at picking, <laughs> picking startups <laughs> to go. Uh, Luis uh, began to teach impassioned business owners how to scale their revenues and impact by creating and selling high-end offers. Um, you also were invited to speak about leadership and personal brandings at business schools across the country, including Stanford, UC Berkeley and Bard. And today you're the Global Director of Revenue Enablement at Deputy, a SaaS workforce management product company, not to mention a published author through Madecraft organization. And what we're going to talk about today is the concept of intrapreneurship, what it is, how to cultivate it, and why it matters. So let, let's just start a obviously baseline, Lewis. Uh, what is intrapreneurship? Yeah, entrepreneurship is a quality of mind and it's a culture that's centered around enabling people to be self-motivated and to be highly accountable to the business and to really own their stake in the business. This is something that I came to terms with actually after stepping away from working in Silicon Valley. Um, I'd always worked in this capacity of being a uh, part of a new sales team, uh, building out brand new territories, new lines of businesses for the companies that I'd worked for um, and, and building you know, strategically from the ground up. It wasn't until I stepped away from working for someone else and working for myself and serving clients that I came to recognize that I had developed those entrepreneurial skills throughout those years of experience in working as a sales uh, person and, and as a sales leader. So when I was ready to sort of jump back in and build my career, um, I sort of jumped in with this new quality of mind and this recognition that building your own business requires you to be a running point project manager, wear all the hats. I'm certainly doing that when I'm working within a company without the overhead. I'm not paying mm -hmm. for my own marketing, right? I'm not um, covering my own legal. Um, I've got teams of people that are built around me to help support the endeavors that I'm on, right? And so, um, I shifted the way that I started showing up in the workplace. And then that also influenced how it is that I lead. And mm -hmm. so now my sort of leadership style is all focused on um, inspiring that quality of mind and that accountability and that sense of ownership in a business. Yeah, because it's, um, it's, it's interesting, Luis, because, uh, you know, salespeople, if you just uh, isolate out salespeople for a moment, I mean, they are the entrepreneurs in, in an organization. They're yeah. the ones who have got variable pay. Maybe they're not even getting any base pay. Yeah. Uh, so they have to be creative. But other groups in the organization, I think that's that the that's where the challenge lies often because they don't know. They don't know or feel like that. They don't feel like they... they um, because they rarely have anything at stake, to be perfectly honest. I mean, they have KPIs, bonus, whatever, but not in the way that that salespeople do. So I think salespeople can take the lead in many ways of, of role modeling that kind of entrepreneurial approach. Absolutely. And if you look at you know what's happened even historically in the Fortune 500, a lot of CEOs and C-level executives have come up and ranked through the sales organization, mm -hmm. right? It is that sort of multifaceted, multi-skilled sort of approach in your career that, that's required, right? As a salesperson, you speak tech, you speak legal, you speak marketing, you speak customer success, right? You learn to uh, bring all these people to the table and to align them and, and get deals and get businesses and partnerships across the table. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I, I can't think of a better sort of uh, path for training and preparation for entrepreneurship than mm -hmm. uh, entrepreneurship via the sales org. So how do you start to cultivate that spirit within an organization? Uh, as we said, I mean, and remember, not all salespeople come from that point of view either. So some yeah. of them have to have to learn it. But how do you how do you cultivate that as a 
within the DNA of an organization. Absolutely. You have to actually start with leadership, right? You have to have everyone bought into this concept and to do things boldly and to, yes, leverage the data and make business cases along the way. Uh, but really, uh, it is a cultural shift that needs to be sustained with the, the sort of style of leadership and the way that people are approached. And so you have to start looking at how do you remove yourself as the bottleneck in processes? Mm -hmm. How do you automate and self-serve and make things more turnkey? How do you elevate communications across the team? making sure that you're deploying and analyzing uh, pulse surveys at a certain frequency, right? Thinking about coaching and office hours and other ways to get inputs from the team, right? And thinking about even sustaining the culture around how do you exemplify success and entrepreneurship? How are you celebrating those people that are exhibiting those behaviors that you want everyone else to also exhibit? Right. So you have to take a moment um, as, you know, as you're approaching this to make sure that the leaders are all equipped with the right coaching and the right frameworks and the right processes to sustain this culture. Then it's about implementation and adoption. There's going to be this moment of hesitation of like, wait, I don't have to ask permission. Wait, you're not going to hound me on this or you're not going to, you know, delay my deals anymore. I can run with this. I can run with these approvals. I'm a boss now. You trust me. Right. There's a moment of adjustment right? And trust development that has to happen on the side of the reps as you're shifting the culture. But yeah. then ultimately the consistency in sustaining that culture is how you cement that trust. It's a long process, not going to deny it, but worth the investment. Yeah. And, and like you said, I mean, it starts with the leadership and that means it also means that everybody in the leadership needs to obviously buy into this. And, yes. and sometimes people don't come from that kind of background or they have this concept of well i run this area and good fences make good neighbors and therefore i'm just going to you know keep everything neatly corralled yeah. and, I, and i'm kind of uncomfortable with what you're talking about because that seems a little bit more kind of fluid or nebulous to me absolutely i often have to stop for a moment and say how wonderful would it feel to show up for work every day and everyone just understands what they should be doing and you know that it's getting done and instead of spending your time and your energy micromanaging you're instead focused on those bigger strategic boulders that need moving how much more operationally efficient could your business be and ultimately how happier would your customers be if they were engaging with people that truly enjoyed the work that they were doing, if they were engaging with people that felt respected at their jobs, right? Mm -hmm. It's an elevation for everyone. But again, to your point, it is that shift. I acknowledge that I come from a very unorthodox corporate setting, having worked in tech, having worked in Silicon Valley, where things are approached differently, right? I've been taught servant leadership as a leadership style not this sort of dictatorial mm -hmm. micromanaging sort of approach that I've also experienced in other industries. And so, um, yes, it is, it is a, a buy-in at the top before we can trickle down the culture. And then I think the other thing is you have to be obviously uh, intentional in your hiring then because you need to hire people who can operate in a, in an environment like that. Yeah. So, you, you know, you hire, uh, you know, salespeople or or whatever who uh, who are coachable, who are flexible, who are eager to to learn new new ways of doing things. And I think above all, as you mentioned it earlier, it's that personal accountability piece. Yeah. Is that if you trust me with something, I'm going to hold myself personally accountable to to deliver it as best I can. Yeah, absolutely. And even thinking about the onboarding experience, right? How you are spoken to and empowered and enabled on the first day sets the tone for how you show up for the rest of your career with that business. And so if you want someone to step into that entrepreneurial mindset and spirit and work ethic, introduce them to that day one, set that expectation day one and reinforce how that's celebrated. Yeah, because no, I, I think that's, that's, that's excellent because often, you know, we put together these onboarding programs and, you know, somebody puts it together and maybe it's a few years old or whatever. And it just, and nobody really wants, let's be honest, nobody really wants to deal with the onboarding part because uh, of other people, because they're too busy doing what they're doing. But to your point is, it's like everything else, you know, the first impression, how you set that is is going to be how they perceive what is important. So if it doesn't look, if, if you don't present it as important, then they're not going to take it as important. Exactly. 
Yeah, it's absolutely the tone that you set. And again, the consistency in your reinforcement. Mm -hmm. So what have you seen when you've worked with some companies? Uh, how have you seen this implemented? And, and what, have, what are some of the results? And maybe what are some of the surprises that your, your clients have experienced? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So typically it starts with alignment on like, who are we uh, enabling and and who are we ultimately supercharging as entrepreneurs within the business, right? Looking at the sales organization, looking at all those individuals who engage with customers and looking at the quality of those engagements. And that's typically what we'll start is just really understanding like, where is the lapse in the customer experience? Mm -hmm. Then we look at, then doing an audit, like what are the systems, processes, tools, training, and things that already exist? Once we have that audit, we can then identify gaps and opportunities for optimizing anything. Once we have that sort of roadmap in place, then you know we start at the top with engaging the leaders, with establishing those playbooks, uh, making sure that we have all the right coaching modules in place for group and individual coaching scorecards and things to help measure and drive performance. Um, that's typically um, where the aha start to happen. Oh, I didn't think of this this way. Oh, I didn't recognize that something this simple could be that impactful. Or, wow, I didn't even think about, you know, these sort of micro moments and coachable moments, right? And a lot of it is because leaders are experiencing a lot of pressure. Like, let's look at what's happening macroeconomically. We have to deliver, deliver, deliver under enormous amount of pressure. We don't always have that moment to hang out 30,000 mm -hmm. feet in the mm -hmm. clouds and have that strategic view. So a lot of that, oh, those aha moments are happening up front. The thing that I've learned is, you know, coming out of these sessions is this ambition of like, yes, let's get it. Let's yeah. do it. Um, you know, how can we get this done in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? What's the roadmap? Let's lay it out. Um, we often have to work and focus on one core area, meaning, you know, when we look at those 90 days and you want to see, you know, as, you know, any sort of shift, we have to determine effectiveness of the things that we're implementing, right? Starting mm -hmm. with coaching programs, on demand, asynchronous, group coaching, et cetera, looking at any assessments that are deployed and things around that. Um, you have to, and again, some of those post surveys also that you want to make sure you're deploying on a quarterly basis. That's going to determine, you know, what's this first milestone and how do we reverse engineer how we get there? Right. Um, and, and you mentioned something there I just wanted to uh, come back on is coaching. And yeah. coaching is so critical, but most people don't know how to coach. Yeah. Now, most people think their last experience of coaching was probably could have been in high school, could have been their football coach screaming from the sideline or their their volleyball coach or whatever. Uh, and and so coaching is not an innate skill that most people have because no. most people think if I if I tell you how I do it, then you should be able to do it. Or, or if I tell you, here's the textbook way of doing it, you should be able right. to do it. And that's not that's not coaching. So talk to me a little bit about how you prepare people for for coaching. Absolutely. I remind folks that the spotlight is always on the coachee, right? Mm -hmm. Your job is not to be the expert or to have the answer, but instead to help them develop their confidence and their capacity for arriving at the solution. Otherwise, when we think about, again, infusing that spirit of entrepreneurship, if that person doesn't have that moment to develop that confidence and shift their self-concept professionally, they will always come to you with questions. They will never make decisions with certainty. And ultimately, that promise of that entrepreneurial culture where everyone moves and hums along confidently won't happen. So you have to reconfigure your approach and really hold the mirror up, right? What is the problem? What is the desired outcome? What are your options for making this happen? Great. Now that we've weighed the options, who else needs to be involved? Which path will you pursue? When is this happening? Are we ready to revisit this in 24 hours, right? It has to be very accountable and actionable once they do arrive at that answer. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes people have that answer within them. They're just scrambling and they don't have that moment to just see, you know, and then and, and sequence their approach. So as a coach, you're holding down that space. You're not interrupting their thinking by inserting your thinking in your answers. You're guiding them with very pointed questions towards arriving at that decision and answer and solution on their own. 
Yeah, and then obviously, hopefully, then they will, you know, take what you're doing, but also be able to run through that process with themselves. So sort of yeah. self-coaching, if you like. Yeah. I often get a lot of resistance from leaders about this coaching approach or even the need for coaching. It's like, won't we move faster if I just give them the answer? It's like, no, if you give them the answer, then all you're doing is giving them fish. You've got to teach them how to fish. Otherwise, they're always going to tap your shoulder and you will never get to the things that are a priority. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I guess then it's it's obviously very important the first time that uh, some of the individuals display this entrepreneurial spirit or do things, and perhaps it doesn't work out. Perhaps it it doesn't work, but they they gave they tried something. I guess it's very important how you how you react and approach that so that they don't go, oh, I'm never doing that again. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, you know, you're, you're uh, assessing, like, what was the desired outcome? What was the actual outcome? Let's look at the facts and then let's explore. Like, where's the opportunity for you to be coached up on the way that you hold people accountable, the way that you corral stakeholders, wherever that moment is. But then let's also look at what is the opportunity in the background. Oh, there are bottlenecks in this process. That was the reason for the lack of confidence in your decision making in this area. These are the things that I need to own as a leader and solve mm -hmm. for, right? And you have to take that sort of methodical approach. Um, so that's why I often say I connect with leaders who walk out of these planning and strategy sessions. They're fired up. They're pumped up. They want to see results right away. But if they're not committed to the coaching and if they're not committed to that, those moments of analysis and growth, if they dismiss those as completely unnecessary or unimportant because there are more important things that need to happen faster right now, mm -hmm. then you'll never see that return on investment for moving down this path of entrepreneurship. Yeah. And, and, and as we touched on earlier, I think part of it obviously is uh, from a leadership point of view is you mentioned there, maybe there are bottlenecks, maybe there are other groups in the organization, other stakeholders who maybe like to operate in a different way and they have to make some changes. Exactly. And, and therefore they have to become part of this process too. Absolutely. I think that also like our, our uh, responsibility, you know, being those people that have the direct relationship with customers, mm -hmm. it's our responsibility to socialize internally what the customer needs, right? And so our processes internally might be designed around assumptions versus actual customer feedback. So you've got to keep those lines of communication open. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. I did I did some uh, lean office training many years ago at the University of Michigan. And uh, one of the things was, uh, is when you lay out like processes and things and you lay them out properly, and then you ask the question, you would say, if, if, Five. If if you told a customer that five dollars of what they pay you pays for that process, do you think they'd say, "Give me the five bucks back"? Because that seems nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a really good way of looking at things. Yeah, no, I certainly appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but it, time, time. It takes time investment. It takes a concerted investment. It's one of those things where you've got to trust the process. I think a lot of folks, um, if you show up at the gym day one and expect to have ripped abs and, and biceps, you know, from one workout, then, you know, your, your uh, expectations are all the way skewed. Same thing goes with shifting the culture of an organization. It is not overnight and it is inter, uh, it is cross-functional. Yeah. Well, yeah, because as you mentioned at the outset is customer experience, customer experience is cross-functional. And I think sometimes yeah. people don't, realize that that you know customer experience is like anything is, is like anything else it's whatever you call it the uh a chain is only as strong as its weakest link a customer experience is only as is only as good as its worst <laughs> as worst <laughs> part because that's how we as human beings react yeah certainly so it's 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 really incredibly important to have it you know across the board it can't be just in one group it can't just fall on the sales organization it's every other part it's the pre-sales marketing it's the post sales it's the support implementation all of that has to has to be uh, customer focused absolutely and that framework around entrepreneurship is you know the way that we start to connect all those dots yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, this has been great, uh, Luis. All of Luis's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Absolutely. You know, by day, I am a global director of revenue enablement at a startup, and I moonlight as a consultant for um, startups and online businesses who are looking to develop their product, their playbooks, or their teams. Um, so if you are curious about what it is that I'm up to, 
um, you can head on over to learnfromluis.com and uh, sign up for my 14-day Flex and Flourish Sales and Leadership Academy. I lay out all the pages of my playbook in there. Excellent. Flex and flourish. Love it. Um, as I said, all of Louis' information will be below here. So I encourage you to go check it out because I think the organizations and the businesses, small, large, medium, whatever, that will succeed in the future are the ones that have more of this uh, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial approach. So uh, great work you're doing, Louis. Thank you, John. I appreciate you for having me today. All right. Well, listen, thank you. Thank you for watching, listening, and I will see you all again soon. Thank you.